Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michaela Hall, Assistant Director of the Library. I want to thank you all for attending the program today and also thank those that put in lots of hard work to make this happen. The Library's Program Committee, especially Susan Martin, Chair of the Committee, and of course, Harry. All participants, as I've been saying, which I'm probably, you're probably sick of hearing me say now, keep your video off and your mics muted unless asked by myself or Harry to turn them on. This will ensure there's no sound interference or lag during Harry's presentation. We have a full house with over 100 registered. If participants have any questions throughout the meeting, please type them in the chat, which library staff member Ivy Burns will be monitoring. All questions will be answered when Harry is ready to open up Q&A. The talk will be about an hour long. Harry will be speaking for 50 minutes and then he will follow it up with some Q&A. I am recording the program. You'll probably see the symbol in the corner. Uh, all personal information, such as names of participants, will be edited out before it's uploaded to our YouTube channel for viewing by those who couldn't attend tonight. Harry has prepared a short bibliography of 20 titles complete with comments for those interested in following the subject further. Ivy put the link to the bibliography as well as Harry's email address in the Zoom chat already, so you can check in the Zoom chat to see that information. Anyone who wishes to contact Harry about the talk, please use his email, which is located in the chat. Thank you again, everyone, and I now turn it over to Susan Martin. Good evening and welcome to our second Zoom talk put on by the Stonington Library. Today we are very fortunate to have Harry Martin speaking to us. Now Harry is no stranger to these talks, having given probably 10 in the last 15 years. He will be speaking on Generals Grant and Lee and the Civil War. Recently Grant has gotten a fair amount of coverage with his series on the History Channel and of course with Chernow's definitive biography on Grant. Many of our reporters, like Judy Woodruff, have his book prominently displayed on their bookshelves as they give the evening news. So without further ado, let's hear from Harry on the two generals and the Civil War, a war that almost tore the country apart. Harry. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for everybody attending. That includes children, grandchildren, friends near and far, Civil War buffs, and a special thank you to my military aide de camp sitting right here with me, Michaela Hall, and my lovely wife as well. Look at those two characters up there. We're gonna be talking about them. The Civil War that waged from 1861 to 1865 was one of America's greatest tragedies. Modern estimates showed it claimed 750,000 lives, or 2.5% of the then population. That would mean 8 million dead today. It divided us destroyed most of the industrial and transportation infrastructure in the South, and almost split our country into two different nations. Its predominant cause was slavery. The unfair treatment of our African-American people continues in other forms today. More than 150 years after the Civil War ended, our country is upended again by the unfair treatment of African Americans. The generals who commanded opposing forces in that compelling war were very different in some ways and very similar in others. We will discover that immediately. Before the Civil War began, almost every senior American military person would have predicted 
that that distinguished man in gray, Robert E. Lee, would become commander of either the Northern or the Southern armies. No one in this country, including Ulysses Grant, would ever, ever have imagined that he would become general in chief of the Union armies. And by the way, in this talk, I use the term federal and union to mean the North and Confederates to use the South. Again, federal or union means the Northern armies of the North. In many respects, Grant and Lee were as different as chalk and cheese, as I just mentioned. Their family backgrounds, personality, and appearance. And let's go to our first slide. So look at Lee's childhood home compared to Grant's where the family lived beside the tannery his father established. Lee was born in 1807. His father, Light Horse Harry Lee, was a dashing colonel in the Revolutionary War, a particular favorite of George Washington. Unfortunately, he was also a wild speculator and ended up disgraced in debtor's prison. However, Lee's mother, Ann Carter, was his father's second wife, and Ann came from a very distinguished Virginia family, the Carters. Robert was educated at their school that they had just for people on the plantation. He was taught to honor Virginia and his family. He became a polished, handsome, young Southern gentleman. Grant, and we look at the other dwelling, was born in 1822, remember this, 14 years after Lee, although they both fought in the two wars. His great-grandfather had been killed in the French and Indian War. His grandfather fought at Bunker Hill, and his father established a tannery on the hard scrabble Ohio frontier. Grant was a small, muscular boy who didn't like school. We go to West Point. Since Lee's father had squandered his inheritance, Robert had to find a career. Instead of being appointed to West Point by a local representative, however, the Carter family went directly to John Calhoun, who was at that point the Secretary of War, and of course, Lee went right into West Point. He was known there as the marble model, ideal cadet, destined for great future things. Grant was the opposite. He graduated not second, but 21st of the 39 men in his class of 1843. Poor Grant was awkward, couldn't converse or dance with the ladies. He was remembered for only one thing. No one equaled him in the saddle. The jump he made on the huge horse York, that height lasted for 30 years. Grant was promoted because of that to cadet sergeant, but he languished and was demoted back to private in his senior year after accumulating many demerits. We wouldn't expect much of this poor lad, Grant. Now here we are in the Mexican-American War, uh, 1846 to 1848. We have the dashing Major Lee on the left, and we have the odd-looking Grant, if I may say, looking puzzled on the right. However, they both learned to command men in battle in the Mexican War from the two generals, Taylor and Scott, who led that war. Zach Taylor, like Grant, eschewed formality in dress or staff. He wore a duster into battle over plain clothes. He had a small staff. Scott, like Lee later, dressed in great military style and had larger formal staffs. But interestingly enough, their similarity in battle, these two generals, was similar. Both departed from the existing 19th century premise that you only went into battle with a larger army because if you lost your army, you lost the war. Instead, both of these generals acted on the principle that with a better led, higher morale, well-generaled army, you could beat a larger opponent. And both Grant and Lee 
used that principle in the Civil War. Lee became a major in the Engineering Corps, a desired assignment. He served on Scott's inner staff. He was cited for great bravery and unusual ability to see weakness in the enemy's positions. Grant's only memorable assignment, remember he's a lot younger and junior, was when he volunteered to carry a message through enemy lines in Monterey, Mexico, to division headquarters on the other side of the city. Hooking his foot over his horse Nellie's saddle and his arm around her neck, Grant galloped on her other side through heavy enemy fire. Then he was appointed to the unglamorous post of regimental quartermaster. However, the skills he learned served him extremely well in the Civil War. Peacetime, 12 years, 1848 to 1860. How different these two men passed those years. Grant had courted sweet, demure Julia before the Civil War, even though her domineering, slave-owning father, Colonel Dent, tried to discourage her from considering him. Grant's leading biographer, Ron Chernow, wrote, quote, Julia was destined to be the bedrock of Grant's life, and he was a hero in her eyes long before he became a national hero. However, Grant and his family were abolitionists. When Julia and Ulysses finally married on August 22, 1848, after the Mexican War ended, they had to wait two years, Grant's family refused to attend the wedding. We already see the vast differences between the slave owning and the abolitionists. During their happy years as a young army couple, Julia had a son. She was pregnant again when in 1852, Grant was assigned as quartermaster of an army group going across Panama to California. Unfortunately, cholera broke out, and Grant was like an, an angel trying to take care of his fellow soldiers and their families. However, Grant was then posted to Northern California. He'd been away for a year or two already, and we can see that he absolutely needed Julia. He became despondent, lonely, bored, and he began drinking. We all know that drinking was one of his problems. For most of his life, Grant suffered from serious chronic alcoholism. During active Civil War service, his loyal aide, John Rollins, always was there to keep Grant away from drink. However, after a battle, Grant was capable of going for a couple of days on one of the boats in the Mississippi on a real heavy binge. However, drinking never affected his command ability. Now that's interesting, isn't it? When Lincoln was told his most successful general was a drunk and should be relieved, he said, tell me the kind of whiskey he drinks and I'll send a case to every other general. Grant resigned from the Army after being confronted up in Northern California in April 1854. This is six years before the Civil War. He returned to Galena, Illinois, where he struggled for years to make a living. He failed miserably with farming and businesses. He never understood money or how to manage it all the way through his life. On December 23, 1857, he pawned his gold watch so he would be able to buy Christmas presents for his children. His life had bottomed out. No future was envisioned for this poor man. Grant received a slave named William Jones from Julia's father. At that time, a 35-year-old male slave would have been worth $1,000, a fortune to poor Grant. So what did Grant do? On March 29, 1859, he signed the papers freeing his slave, William. Lee's life from 1848 to 1860 was dramatically different. He had a fine military career. 
as an engineer building and improving installations all over the country. He became head of West Point from 1852 to 1855, a prestigious position. He was assigned in 1859 to suppress John Brown's takeover of Harper's Ferry, he succeeded. Just before the Civil War, Lee was a full colonel commanding the military department of Texas. Lee had married Mary Custis, great granddaughter of Martha Washington. Martha had inherited a large estate with his mansion on the Potomac River. Both men had devoted lives with their wives and Lee was devoted to Mary and she to him, although she stayed in Virginia on the plantation with their four children during most of his assignments. Now we get into the source of what we're talking about, the succession, the 11 states of the Confederacy. The desire for succession was driven by southernmost states whose economy, look at them up on the board, was dominated by the big plantations growing cotton, indigo, and rice. They required huge populations of slave labor. Now listen to this sentence, everyone. Georgia in 1860 had only $11 million worth of industrial assets. In 1860, Georgia had 203 million invested in slaves, 20 times the industrial assets. You wonder what the war was about? These planters who owned the slaves of these states were the oligarchs. They also controlled the political processes of South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. They had an enormous amount to lose from the threatening political movement against slavery arising in the North. South Carolina had more slaves than all of the border states combined. When Lincoln was elected in November 1860, many in the South predicted anti-slavery forces in the North would soon control the U.S national political process threatening their livelihood, their society, their way of life. In early February, remember the original succession states, the seven, created the Confederacy in Mobile, Alabama. They named Jefferson Davis as their president. He was a country within a country. On April 12, 1861, federal forces in Fort Sumter, Fort Charleston Harbor, South Carolina, were bombarded by superior Confederate forces, and on the 14th of April, the fort surrendered. Thereafter, <clears throat> by June 8, from April, four other states joined the Confederacy. Isn't it interesting they were holding back Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee. Few of the succession states or the people who created the Confederacy had any idea the war would last for four long, cruel years. Okay, poor Grant was on the bottom in that little town doing his best to support his family. He was a humble clerk now in his father's tannery. He had no political ability, and many people were appointed in, in the armies that were created out of their relationship with the local representatives or senators. Nevertheless, people recognized he'd been in the army. On June 8, 1861, he's appointed colonel of the 21st Illinois Regiment of Volunteers. This was a hard scrabble group of 700 guys and they needed to be pulled together into a fighting unit, and that's exactly what Grant did. And in doing so, he came to the attention of his seniors. General John Fremont, who was credited with discovering the West, decided that the way the Union had to fight this war was to control the Mississippi and take the Confederate courts up and down that river. He looked for a man 
to be in charge of all of the Union forces in the West, he reached way down in the list of generals and picked out Grant. He said, I selected him for qualities I could not find combined in any other officer. Now listen to this. Military experts compare Fremont's decision in importance to President Roosevelt choosing Eisenhower to lead the invasion of France. Lee now is a splendid colonel. Look at him. <clears throat> okay. He's a colonel and a southerner. However, he had come to the attention of his seniors in a very different way from Grant. He just exuded command presence. On April 17, three days after Fort Sumter Falls, right? He summoned to Washington to be a commander of an army, the largest American army ever formed, 75 to 100,000 men. And Lincoln decides that Lee should lead it. And Lee says, I cannot accept this magnificent appointment. I love my country, but I love Virginia more. I cannot work with an army invading my homeland. His homeland was the South and Virginia. General Scott, his previous commander in the Mexican War, and then the most senior military person in the United States said, Lee, you have made the greatest mistake of your life. The Confederate capital had been transferred to Richmond, Virginia, a strategic mistake. Why put your capital right next to the border with your enemy? Lee was summoned there by Jefferson Davis, this is to Richmond, who asked him to become the commander of the Army and Navy of Virginia. Virginia was the most populous, important Confederate state. Davis was a West Point graduate. He had fought in the Mexican War and later became Secretary of the Army. This was not good for Lee. Davis not only many managed Virginia's military forces, he invited other Confederate generals to the state that where Lee was supposed to be commanding the largest Confederate army. The first battle in Virginia, Manassas Bull Run, July 21, and note that things didn't happen immediately. A few months went by all the time. Was led not by Lee, but by General Beauregard. He reported not to Lee, but to President Davis. Lee was horribly frustrated. He had not fought or won any great battles. By the end of that year, 1861, critics were calling him Granny Lee. However, in 1862, we're going to see that Lee establishes himself as a great general in the East, and Grant establishes himself as a great general in the West. So let's look at Lee's successive battles. <clears throat> Seven Days, Second Manassas, Harper's Ferry, Sharpsburg, Fredericksburg. Lee, first of all, stopped McClellan, who was then uh, Lincoln's great general. McClellan had an army of 105,000. He was attacking Richmond, and Lee stopped him with an army of 85,000. He then defeated another larger army at Manassas. He took his army into Maryland, captured Harper's Ferry, attacked Sharpsburg, Antietam, with strong, that had strong federal forces. By now, Lee's men were in tattered uniforms. Some didn't have shoes, that didn't matter. Lee fought a great fight there. He claimed a victory, so did the North, but when, England and France saw that the Confederacy had not clearly won in the first year. They delayed the recognition of the Confederacy. And Lincoln then had the Emancipation Proclamation. So then one more chance the Union had. They had more men, even those early days. They attacked Lee again at Fredericksburg. They failed. Listen to what Lee had done at all these various battles in 1862. 
His army had sustained 48,000 casualties. The Union, 72,000, almost twice as much. He'd captured 75,000 arms. He'd only lost 6,000. He took 155 cannon. He only lost eight. He was a miracle man. And now we have the most unlikely miracle man in the world, only he's out on the Mississippi. Remember, Grant and Lee never had anything to do with each other in the first great year of the Civil War. In 1862, Grant racked up one victory in the West with his army of Tennessee after another. Listen to this. In succession, Fort Henry surrendered to Grant on February 6th. Fort Donelson with 15,000 Confederate soldiers on February 16, 10 days later. Nashville on February 25. Fort Pillow was abandoned on June 4. Lincoln finally had a winning commander. He never met him, by the way. He promoted Grant to Major General. Grant had taken Western Tennessee and gained control of the upper Mississippi, terribly important for the Union. He led his men into battle after battle, bonding with them as they bonded with him. But interestingly enough, Grant's defining moment came after these early victories at Shiloh. You've all heard of Shiloh, April 6 to 8, 1862. After these defeats, the Confederates were furious. They were determined to destroy this unknown General Grant and his army. They attacked him, they attacked him with 50,000 men. This rarely happened to Grant being surprised. He was surprised. He lost a third of his army in the first two days of that three-day battle. Most generals would have retreated. At midnight of the second day, William Tecumseh Sherman, Grant's leading general in the Battle of Shiloh, came to him absolutely convinced that they had to retreat. Sherman later wrote, when I saw Grant under a tree in the pouring rain, I was moved by some wise and sudden instinct. I did not dare mention retreat. Instead, I said, Grant, we've had the devil's own day, haven't we? And little General Grant turned and looked at him and said, back to your men, General, we'll lick them tomorrow. And they did, as Grant, at early light, rode throughout his army, encouraging his men to attack. Any other general, particularly one with as little experience as he had, would have retreated, saving the remnant of his army. Grant knew the Confederates were exhausted and vulnerable. He had an invincible belief in himself, the characteristic of a great commander. He won Shiloh, his first really important battle. However, the army was a very political place and Grant had a superior named General Halleck who was very conservative. And many generals resented the fact that this new fellow was claiming these victories. So his commander, Halleck, sidelined him, took his command away for, from him for a month or so, and Grant was despondent. He was going to leave the army. Can you imagine after these victories, Sherman came to him, begged him to stay in the army, and Grant did. Later, Sherman said, I supported Grant when he was drunk and he supported me when I was crazy. This is Grant's greatest battle of the war, and now we're in 1863. Remember, each General Grant and Lee won a string of battles in the East and the West in 62. 63 is the determining year of the Civil War, and there are two battles which are determining one fought by Grant Vicksburg and the other one Appomattox. Let's go to Vicksburg first. Grant spent early 63 planning to capture Vicksburg 
the great fortress Confederate city controlling the lower river. It was protected by great forts on the east bank and a swarm north of the city. There were numerous great cannon on the east bank and in order to get his men down the river, Grant had the flotilla sail so close to the east bank that the, the cannon shots went over. And out of 11 ships, only one was hit seriously. So he takes his army down the river, the Mississippi, south of Vicksburg, then he takes them inland. Now, anyone in his right mind would have attacked Vicksburg from the south, but not Grant. Further over east was Jackson, Mississippi, which had a, a, an, a, another Confederate army that was going to reinforce Vicksburg. So here is Grant. He's got two armies in Vicksburg and Jackson, Mississippi, totaling 60,000 men. He only has 39,000. He's in the middle of enemy territory. What does he do? He decides he's going to attack each army one by one and beat them both. First, he beats the army in Jackson. Then he goes to Vicksburg. And after a siege, poor General Pemberton has to surrender his 30,000 men to Grant. An enormous victory. Then there were a couple of other battles. There are so many battles, folks, by the way, if we talked about all of them, you'd be driven right up the wall. But Cheekamonga was a battle after Vicksburg that Grant uh, lost. But then the next terribly important and last battle of 63 was Chattanooga. And Grant won Chattanooga at Missionary Ridge. Now, there were many prisoners taken, not only at Vicksburg, but at Chattanooga. And now we're going to look at Grant, the human being. Here's a Confederate prisoner at Chattanooga. He looks up and he sees Grant passing with his generals. Quote, when Grant reached us ragged, bloody, miserable men, he lifted his hat in respect. He held it over his head as he passed our last man in our living funeral cortege. He was the only federal officer to so recognize us. Okay, now we're back in Virginia with Lee, and it's 1863, he's had a great string of victories in 62. At Chancellorsville, he's attacked <clears throat> by a larger Union army, and he's got Andrew Jackson there. And he, again, with his incisive understanding of the enemy weakness, Lee orders Jackson to attack around the right flank. And Jackson's screaming rebels beat the Union Army at Chancellorsville, twice as large as Lee. However, Stonewall Jackson is killed by friendly fire. This will be very meaningful. So here's Lee poised to take the East in the middle of 1863. It looks like he's invincible, right? Wrong. Lee's determining defeat at Gettysburg. American history would have been drastically changed had Lee's army won a decisive victory at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. In spite of Grant's victories in the West, after all, the East is, the, the Union is mostly in the East. The North, the Union, was suffering terrible losses. Powerful groups were sick of the war. There was political infighting in the North against the war. They were critical of the Republicans led by Lincoln, eager to replace him in the coming elections. The Confederacy, could negotiating a peace with the North, leaving them as a separate country if they had a huge battle right in Pennsylvania at the border of, of, of all of what the North was fighting to protect. England and France would recognize the Confederacy. 
Lee decided he had to go to Gettysburg in the North, not only to win that victory for the South, they needed so badly, but his army was starving, they had no clothes, and he had to provision himself from Pennsylvania. Now, why did the great General Lee lose the Battle of Gettysburg? Not by chance, not by fate. He lost it because of his own command failure and the command failures of his three key lieutenants, Jeb Stewart, cavalry commander, Dick Ewell, corps commander, and Longstreet, corps commander. Stewart's responsibility with his 10,000 cavalry troops was to find out the exact strength of the Union forces at Gettysburg, where had they reinforced, where should Lee attack. Instead, he takes his 10,000 cavalry men east of Gettysburg to find a great Union of 145 richly laden wagons, which his men pillaged. Instead of going back to Gettysburg, he then decided to go north of Gettysburg, and he only came back to Gettysburg on the end of the second day, too late to tell Lee, and he didn't even know what the Union forces were doing. Lee never seriously reprimanded him. So now Gettysburg is three days, right? Lee has been meandering around and comes back the end of the second day of no use to, to uh, Lee, or, or rather Stuart. Dick Ewell on the first day, Corps commander with several armies, he has his generals come to him on the Gettysburg uh, situation and tell him, General Ewell, there are several heights here and they're not defended yet. If we attack those heights on the first day, we can command them and win the Battle of Gettysburg. For unknown reasons, Ewell refuses to let them attack, infuriating his generals. He is never reprimanded by Grant. Now we go to the third lieutenant, and that is Longstreet, who was a great friend of Grant's before the war, by the way. Before the Battle of Gettysburg, Longstreet had urged Lee, seriously, not to attack any federal forces anymore because they had so many more men than the South, but to continue the situation where the Confederates would defend their forts in the South, force the Union to attack them, and suffer such losses that the public in the North would not allow the North to continue fighting. Lee begged, or Lee was begged by Longstreet, but he didn't remember those arguments. So now we go to the second and third day of Gettysburg. <clears throat> the, the, the important general on the field is James Longstreet. And when he's ordered by Lee to attack on the second day in the morning of the third, he manages to refuse to make his men attack. He avoids attack because he's so worried about being defeated. Instead of reprimanding him, Lee finally on the third day says, you must have Pickett attack, Pickett's fa famous charge. Longstreet still holds back. He's afraid of a slaughter. Finally, he has to order Pickett to attack, Pickett attacks, and it's a miserable loss. Lee comes up to find Pickett, and he said, General, how about a counterattack? And poor Pickett says to Lee, General Lee, I have no division commanders left. They are all down. And Lee says, don't worry, General Pickett. The responsibility is all mine. The responsibility indeed. At Gettysburg, the war was basically over. Lee retreats. Huge numbers of his men begin to desert. This is the late afternoon of July 3. And remember when Lee has his greatest defeat on July 3, Grant has just won the Battle of Vicksburg in the West. What's happening to the South during this time? 
order collapses. Lincoln's Emancipation Doctrine said, we will free the slaves throughout the Confederacy on January 1, 63, if the South does not surrender. This is mid-63, July, right? Soldiers begin to desert in the South, returning to protect their families. Confederate states are suffering from bands of lawless men, deserters, who rob and rape the soldiers' wives. The war has drained the South of the people who used to look over the slaves, and it's left the women to do this. They can't control the large slave populations. Desperate wives write to their husbands at the front in Virginia, please come home, we're starving, protect us. Can you imagine how you would feel if you were a Confederate soldier? And furthermore, you see that you're losing the war. Movements opposed to secession begin to threaten local Southern governments. Confederate authorities had to publicly hang their opposition in the South. In April 63, before Gettysburg, a large group of women in Richmond riot, marching on President Davis's office, demanding bread for their families. The South is being torn apart from within. What a shame a peace was not reached 22 months before the end of the war. Okay, here we see Lincoln has brought Grant East. <clears throat> After his victories in the West, Grant was a national hero. Many thought he should challenge Lincoln for the presidency, but he refused, gratifying Lincoln, who made him commander in chief of all the Union armies early in March, 1864. The president did not imitate Jefferson Davis's attempt to general his war in Virginia. Taking Grant to meet the Secretary of the Army, Mr. Stanton, President Lincoln says, Mr. Stanton, you and I have been trying to boss this job, but we haven't done very well, have we? We have sent across the mountains for Mr. Grant, as Mrs. Grant calls him, and I think we had better leave him alone to do as he pleases. Now we see why Grant is a great general. He was the person Lincoln needed. He had the strategic sense to coordinate Union forces, previously not really directed by one hand, to begin attacking Confederate forces all over the South. He chose aggressive Phil Sheridan to lead the now fully coordinated federal cavalry forces. Grant now commands over half a million troops. He has the full support of the North. All he had to do was wear down Lee, isolate his forces outside Virginia, and end the war. Lincoln has been elected, and Grant is convinced he's going to end slavery. He hated slavery, but he did not hate the Confederates. And this is interesting in our day when our country is so divided. He hated slavery, but he regarded the Confederates as Americans who had gone astray. The United States had 31, oh, look at that photograph of Grant at Cold Harbor. <clears throat> the United States had 31 million people in 1864, 21 million in the North and 10 million in the South. But of the 10 million in the South, three and a half million are slaves. Both sides were suffering terrible losses. Grant could afford those losses. He could replace them. Lee could not. Now, the interesting thing about 1864 is that Grant attacked Lee all over Virginia, but he never won a decisive victory. He suffered heavier casualties than Lee at the Wilderness, which you've heard of, and especially Cold Harbor. The press began to describe him as Butcher Grant. Grant knew he had to defeat 
the symbol of the Confederacy, Lee's army. And he had to do it in spite of the losses. And in spite, instead of quitting or leaving or doing a peace, which would have been some compromise, Grant held on. Longstreet, who had known Grant years before, said to Lee just at this point, we cannot afford to underestimate Grant. He will fight us every day and every hour until the end of this war. Grant withdraws from Cold Harbor. He miraculously builds the largest pontoon, Puma pontoon bridge ever built to date, transports his in huge army across the James River and begins to attack Petersburg and Richmond. Okay, we go to the next slide. William Tecumseh Sherman. By the way, Sherman had been a banker and a professor. He was an intellectual. He doesn't look like an intellectual there. He looks like one warrior who's going to beat the hell out of you. And that's what he does. He is told by Grant, and this is another great characteristic. Sherman, you've got an army of 100,000 men in Tennessee. You've got three generals, you and two others. You take your army and you beat the Confederacy in Georgia, and you do it any way that you think makes sense. Wow. So Grant takes 100,000 men. He goes right through the Confederate armies trying to defend Georgia. He captures Atlanta in July 1864, a huge symbol, destroys his transportation and military facilities. Savannah, Georgia on the coast, is abandoned to Sherman's army in December. By early 65, he had taken Charleston, South Carolina with a harbor fort. He'd taken Columbia, South Carolina and Wilmington, North Carolina, the last Confederate blockade running port outside Texas. Meanwhile, Grant had ordered Phil Sheridan to take his cavalry and ravage the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. At the same time, he directs General Smith, he's the guy who took Missionary Ridge at Chattanooga, to destroy Hood's Confederate Army at Nashville, Tennessee. In November 1864, I've said this before, Lincoln won the presidency. Grant had overwhelmed the South. The North rejoiced. Now, just a minute, we're going to stay with, with Sherman because there's a wonderful story. Sherman is described as a butcher, savage, terrible man. Remember, these guys had been together, many of them at West Point, and General Hood, who's fighting uh, General Smith in Tennessee, General Hood's a great Confederate general, um, leaves his wife in Atlanta, or Savannah, I can't remember which, is not important. And in effect, uh, confines her to the protection of Sherman. And it's an interesting moment because Sherman, who was a man after all, said, the most admirable, handsome woman in the South, General Hood's wife, called on me and asked me to protect her. And of course, Sherman did. And Sherman said, if I'm such a beast, why did my friends from West, West Point? relegate their wives and families to my protection. Anyway, so much for Sherman. Now, thank you, Michaela. Oh boy, this is the most remembered moment of the Civil War, and happily, it's a great moment. On the left, we have General Grant and General Lee, and on the right, we have General Joshua Chamberlain. Let me tell you what happened. <clears throat> Grant's continued attacks back in Virginia, remember he took his army across the James River, at, at Petersburg and Richmond finally convinced Lee that he, his army was almost defeated. He abandoned Petersburg and Richmond, he took his army south and had to surrender at Appomattox. Lee was dressed in a tailor-made pearl gray uniform with red sash and gold scabbard 
sword. Grant wore an old flannel shirt and pants over muddy boots. Grant later wrote, I felt anything rather than rejoicing at the downfall of a foe who had fought so valiantly. Lee told Grant privately he'd been reduced to poverty. Now this is terribly important. And this shows that America can reconcile itself in spite of great differences, something we need to think about today. Grant was known before as unconditional surrender Grant, not at Appomattox. Grant decreed each Confederate officer later extended to men could return to their homes with their mount, their horse, their sidearm and baggage required to protect and keep their fam fam family farms going in the South. Even more crucial were Grant's terms that every officer and man would not be disturbed by United States forces again, so long as they observed their parole, as it was called, their agreement not to fight the Union. This meant that a vengeful North could not bring charges of treason or other crimes against officers like Lee. After Lincoln's death, President Johnson tried to do just that, tried to hold Lee guilty of treason. Grant threatened to resign and Johnson backed down. As General Gordon, led his Confederate army in gray down a road flanked by a victorious federal troops in blue, Maine's General Joshua Chamberlain, Medal of Honor winner at Gettysburg, order his bugler to, to make the call, order arms, the marching salute. The men in blue saluted the men in gray marching between them. The men in gray returned their salute. This is what ought to happen. Let's look at the Civil War. 750,000 dead. These fathers, sons, and brothers equaled American losses in every other war we fought to date. Think about it. A much smaller country. Civil order in the South was in disarray its infrastructure destroyed. Leadership had shifted in the South from the oligarch planters who voted for the war but failed to serve in it to the Confederate officers who fought so valiantly. In Richmond, Virginia, statues of the military leaders who fell face north towards their enemies. The survivor statues like Lee faced south towards the people they had to protect. Public concern about honoring leaders who defended slavery right now today, June 14, 2020, the question is raised as to whether Lee's statue should be pulled down. Just for your information, I don't think it should, but we can't discuss that because you're not here in front of me. Reconstruction of the Negroes' rights in the South we're going back to Civil War, just ended, faced almost insurmountable obstacles. Powerful groups of white supremacists terrorized free slaves. These battles went on for decades. Grant had to send federal forces down in effect to fight against the Ku Klux Klan. Okay, now we go to Lee and Grant as men after the Civil War. Lee never owned more than a few slaves. He had not witnessed the worst practices of treating slaves on the large plantations. He had an ambiguous view of slavery. He wrote before the war that he understood its moral and political evils but he assumed it would eventually be removed by a wise, merciful providence. How was that going to happen? He denied abolitionists and the North had the right to take slaves, which were the property of the Confederates. He thus left the future of slavery up to God, not acknowledging 
that men, not God, created slavery. He did not acknowledge that he had led the Confederate forces into battles where 750,000 men died, some supporting and some opposing slavery. It's hard to say he was hypocritical because the entire South, almost to a man, particularly the leadership, felt the same way that Lee did. Okay, as the war went on in 1864, we're going back a year now, the federal government had seized the 1100 acre estate in Arlington, Virginia, that was home to Mary and uh, Robert Lee. The Union dead were being buried there, and I'll bet many of you don't know that their estate became Arlington Cemetery. It had been their home. When Lee surrendered at Appomattox, Mary, his wife, was invalided in a wheelchair. Their son, Rooney, had been captured. Their other son, Custis, was desolate, and their second daughter, Annie, had died. Lee lost his home his financial resources, Virginia, and the Confederacy. He was asked to be president of Washington College in Lexington, Virginia, now known as Washington and Lee. Distinguished Southerners made substantial contributions to the college. They built a house specially for Lee and his family and Mary oversaw it. Lee regarded education as a key to bring the South back to its pre-war status he personally helped many of his boys become fine characters who would protect their state and their family, much as Lee had done. Four years after the war, in May 1869, Grant is in his second term of presidency. He asked Lee to come to the White House. Now, this is interesting. Grant reaches out to Lee with levity, making jokes, trying to be a human being friend again with Lee. Lee was reserved. He could not enter into this intimacy. He died peacefully at Washington College on October 12, 1870, at the age of 63. His students were praying for him. The South mourned. Grant. This is an appraisal of Grant by military experts. One of the greatest British military writers is John Keegan. Keegan, quote, Grant was the towering genius of the Civil War. Lee and Jackson were great generals, but men of limited imagination. Neither forced the North to fight on their terms. Both defended the South frontiers rather than exhausting the enemy. Chernow on Grant. Grant, in contrast, had a comprehensive strategy to defeat the Southern armies, ending the war. Lincoln, who had become friendly with Grant, they were humble men from the Middle West, they had a lot in common. Ask Grant, <coughs> excuse me, ask, just a moment, everybody. Lincoln asked Grant and his wife, Julia, to be in their box that fateful night at Ford's Theater. Junior, Julia was at odds with Mary Lincoln. Mary Lincoln was one tough lady and people had a lot of trouble with her. So Julia declined. Grant always regretted he had not been there to possibly save his chief from a death that plunged the nation into sorrow. He didn't know at the time that Booth had planned to kill him along with Lincoln in the booth. The most enduring legacy of Grant's two terms as president was his determined effort to help former slaves become valued protective citizens. He never lost that feeling of trying to change and heal hateful slavery. During the early challenging Reconstruction period when he was a general in his first term of president, he ordered forces from the North down to the South to protect the white, protect the slaves from the white supremacists. He fought continually 
as general and president to make Reconstruction work. He had fought not only to save the Union, but to abolish slavery. But in his second term, the American public, including some of Lincoln's party, the Republicans, did not sufficiently support Grant's continual military enforcement of Reconstruction, and he finally gave up, allowing right, white supremacy to rule the South until Jack Kennedy's presidency. A hundred and five or 10 years. He left the presidency after two terms. He toured the world with Julia. Then he lost all his money investing with a fraudulent young swindler named Ferdinand Ward, who had formed an investment firm, which was bogus, with Grant's naive, unknowing son, Ulysses Jr. Imagine having done all for the country that he did. He's now absolutely, he's got $30 and Julia has 80. And his son was so dumb that he didn't understand what was happening. He then begins to write his memoirs. He's suffering from severe throat cancer. He smokes cigars all of his life. He's dying from throat cancer. Mark Twain comes to him, gets for him a good deal with the publisher, and Grant writes his memoirs until three days before he dies. He receives $200,000 as an advance from the publisher, the largest ever received, and he saves Julia and the family from poverty. He dies in August 1885 at age 63, the same age as Lee. Walt Whitman compares Grant to the other greatest Americans to date, George Washington, Lincoln, and Ralph Waldo Emerson. Over one million people in New York City turned out for his funeral. This is the hard scrabble little kid from Galena, Illinois. Paul Bear has included generals from both the Union and Confederate armies. John Gordon insisted, who surrendered the army at Appomattox, at being a pallbearer. His friend and former adversary, James Longstreet, declared, Grant was the bravest and truest man who ever lived. No one would have expected that the survivors of the Stonewall Jackson Brigade from Staunton, Virginia, would march up Fifth Avenue to honor Ulysses Grant. Great generals, beloved by their people, thank you very much for coming this evening. And just a reminder, this is a very complex, difficult subject. Anyone who wishes to communicate with me by email, as well as the chat questions, which we're going to entertain immediately, just a reminder, the email is hfmartin60 at gmail.com. I turn it over to Michaela.